Right, so let's get started. So first of all, thank you very much, Daniel, for agreeing to give a colloquium at our monthly African Biophysics Colloquium series. And it's my pleasure to introduce you. Also glad to see a, a great audience today. That's also very encouraging. So thanks also for the effort you have done in that regard. So um, you have probably all received the short biography of Daniel, but I'm going to highlight a few aspects of that. So um, Daniel Shadrach did his PhD um, through a joint collaborative effort between ICTP in Trieste, Italy, and NM Eist in Arusha, Tanzania. So um, yeah, the university in Tanzania, that's a Nelson Mandela African Institution of Science and Technology. And um, yeah, well, already in the name, we it is, it's great to know that you have been affiliated with an institution that has been honoring our former president, Nelson Mandela. And um, okay, so that was the, the uh, PhD that Shadrach did. And after that, he continued his academic journey as a postdoctoral fellow at the same institution. Um, and what I particularly like of of Dr. Shadrach is his passion for advancing biophysics education, primarily in Africa. And for that purpose, he has spent a lot of effort in organizing biophysics schools across Africa. Um, yeah, um, he has also invited me a couple of years ago during COVID um, to attend one of those schools, so give um, some some presentations there. So. Um, yeah, advancing biophysics in Africa is something that is also dear to my own heart. That's a passion that both Dr. Shadrach and I are sharing. So currently, Dr. Shadrach holds the esteemed position of Director of Research Innovation and Consultancy at St. John's University in Tanzania, where his research is dedicated to the development and, and application of cutting-edge computational biophysics techniques for drug discovery and development. And within that topic, he's going to um, address the um, yeah, the topic that you are you are seeing. His first slide: breaking barriers in drug discovery, the fusion of atomistic simulation and machine learning in computational biophysics. So, Chadwick, we are looking forward to your presentation, and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Jad. It's my pleasure for inviting me. Thanks a lot. And thanks uh, for the audience to be here. And uh, I'll take you through various uh, aspects of biophysics and tools uh, that we, we, we use in, in, in biophysics. <clears throat> so as uh, Jat already mentioned, I have been taking the lure to organize and train many young scientists in, in the continent with respect to biophysics. I really believe in the capacity building and I believe that in, in, in a short while, we will be a big community in the continent and beyond. So this is why we invest time and energy and money to train many many other uh, uh, scientists in this field. For this year, um, uh, we'll be moving across Kenya and the Uganda uh, in collaboration with ICTP. Uh, to sensitize about biophysics and they give in some short causes. And this is will really create uh, more awareness and also to bring, uh, you know, <clears throat> sensitivity to many Africans. So uh, my research area 
always is at the interface of drug design. So I work between chemistry, physics, and biology. So using physics principle to answer questions in biology physics and, and also to answer questions in medicine. And therefore I focus uh, on protein ligand interaction. We focus on trying to understand the solute solvent interaction, like how the solvent uh, perturbs the, the, the conformation or the structure of a small molecule. And this is very important, trying to understand the conformation of a small molecule. And nowadays, now we are employing machine learning and or AI in, in trying to complement molecular dynamics techniques or a simulation approach. And to, we have started with solubility prediction and bioactivity uh, prediction. So the fusion of these approaches and techniques seems to be a very promising strategy. I also collaborate with experimental uh, people to try to understand the self-assembly process of natural compound. Uh, with answering question for the electric responses. And also I'm much interested in trying to understand the crystal uh, structure and, and the what at the interfaces between the crystal surfaces of small molecules, because the changes from crystalline to amorphous has an implication in the drug design. So we needed to inform the scientific community about what happened. So, for the past years, my group have been focused on malaria, Parkinson, SARS-CoV-2, and HIV and nanomedicine. But now we are going into other more non-communicable diseases. So for the purpose of this talk, I will entirely focus only on the SARS-CoV-2, what we have done and what is our contribution from our, our group. So all the technique and the results I'm going to share are only focused on SARS-CoV-2. Next time we can share for other Parkinson, malaria, or the nanomedicine aspect what we have done in field. So I will take you back. I know many of you knows all this aspect. So now we are in a new era in a modern state of drug design, drug discovery, where comparison to the previous uh, era approach. So the classical approach of drug design was like, does it work? Does it function? Yes. Let's go and test it. But in the modern way, we start is, is like a, a vice versa of it. So we start for understanding the target and screening, developing some molecule against it and checking it and validating it. But in the classic one, the phenotypic one, we start with, does it work first? If it works, yes. There are many molecules in the past. So we are discovered by just, does it work? Yes. For example, uh, one of the antibiotic. So it is working. How will come later? So in the modern way, we start by identifying a target. And then we needed to find some lead compound. And we do a lot of optimization involving a lot of chemistry perspectives. And then once we find an optimum molecule, we can go to do in vitro and in vivo. And then we can move to clinical trial, which again is a multi-stage or a multi-step process. So the whole entire this process, if it is done traditionally, it takes about 15 years, 12 to 15 years in average, very costly. And that uh, the chance of success also is very low. So you normally start with the millions of compounds, the thousands of compounds. The chance that all of them will work is very low. So you'll always end up with one or two, or sometimes none. And it is very costly. And this is why many pharmaceutical companies are very reluctant in investing a lot of money in, 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 in bringing new chemical entities because of there is no assurance whether this is going to work. So that is the challenge. But nowadays, because of the advent of computer, hardware, and algorithms, and now we are in the AI era, there has been a change in the way how we used it to do before or the process of drug discovery 
and uh, in before and at the moment. So AI and in silico technology are really liberal, liberalizing the whole process of drug design. So in like from the every single stage, from identifying or discovering the target, AI or the in silico technology are employed from the beginning up to the clinical trials in human. And now we can do some clinical trial in a human. And this has been really verified by one of uh, uh, a research company in silico medicine. They have developed an in clinical tool that can help to, to do a clinical trial to predict whether the morgue is going to be successful in a human clinical trial. I will uh, dive in in a few seconds. So traditionally, the whole process, people say is that, yes, it is somehow broken because uh, there is very higher risk, it takes longer time, is very costly, and th this it has a lot of challenges. And now the fusion of these techniques is trying to bring a hope. So we have uh, several biophysics tools. If they're integrated, they can help to fast track the whole process. And uh, the good thing is that we integration of this, if you can see my plot here, they can help to explore a larger chemical space within a short time. But if we go traditionally, we just explore a small chemical space of compound, but very, you know, you take a very long time. Again, these tools, they have different complexity and how you can involve the chemical species. So moving from machine learning to quantum mechanics, actually the level of chemical space involved is different. Of course, there is also issue about the cost and the, the, the accuracy of the information. But with machine learning can help if we, we, the intention is first to explore a larger chemical space and then we can narrow down it to improve the accuracy and the performance of the tool, we can narrow down with small, small techniques after we have explored. So this saves time, saves a lot of energy. So we can involve all these uh, techniques, I, I tried to highlight above, from target identification, and now we are using like a technique like omics. So omics is an integration or a combination of proteomic, genomic, transcriptomic, and so on and so on. So there are different approaches. Thanks to Alpha for two, it's been very instrumental in, 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 in predicting targets and bioinformatics. For example, uh, of these techniques like the panda or mix at in silico medicine has been very uh, profound tool in helping identify the target for small molecules. For experimental people, they help a lot when we want to identify because they can crystallize the, 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 the structure, whether it is a protein or it is a DNA by using different experimental techniques. For example, as it could be an MRI, X-ray, et cetera. So from target identification, I will talk through from heat to read optimization process to clinical trial with personal experiences that I learned with all the whole cause of drug discovery and, and drug uh, development. So the involvement or integration of deep learning, machine learning with molecular dynamics coupled with enhanced sampling and endpoint free energy and the preclinical, whether it is in vitro or in, uh, in, in silico or is in wet lab, maximize the chance for getting success rate. And when we go to clinical trial, we can still remain with AI assisted personalized medicine because patients, we are highly personalized. And then I will talk about the previous stages that we used or have been employed in clinical trial and the next uh, aspect that we try to visualize how it's going to be. So the issue is there is a mixture of machine in mind. So let the master design, let's make, let's test with the combination of this. And therefore, because of the existence, for example, for non-communicable diseases, 
with the presence of the human genome. We can do personalized medicine, despite that now we are in a very early, early stage and we are not yet there. So the future seems to be very promising. Why? Because we will soon begin doing a personalized clinical trial. Today, or currently, we are based on a cohort. Next, we will be doing algorithm-based clinical trial because we human we have differences. So the clinical trials will be based on precision medicine or personalized medicine that each individual will be requiring an individual treatment and not as the average as we do at the moment. So now we'll start trying to highlight some of this technique a little bit in advance. There has been a considerable integration of deep learning and the machine learning and physics-based approaches for screening large chemical species within a very short time. So incorporating standard docking method and deep learning, it is enabling to screen proteomic scale that is going to an omic level. Within a very short time, we can understand and we can have some heat more accurate by screening large database with an improved efficiency of the tool and also with a, a, a very higher prediction ability that the molecule once goes to some uh, clinical testing is likely to do much better and it takes time. The other tool is the molecular dynamics simulation. This is a versatile tool in the biophysics and in drug design, drug discovery. So in molecular dynamics, we just solve the Newton equation of motion, and we needed to have the potentials. So we computed the bonded and the non-bonded interaction, but it has some weaknesses that we don't capture some non-covalent interaction, and there is no bond breaking or bond formation. The other challenge of molecular dynamics, despite its versatile and widely used, is that normally the reaction gets trapped in a certain minimum, and it takes a long time. This is why we say classical molecular dynamics is, is somewhat expensive. So in order to uh, overcome this limitation, 12 years ago, Laio and Perinello, they developed the, a tool called metadynamics. So in metadynamics is that you are discouraging the system to spend a lot of energy once it has visited the phase space, so it should visit vest another phase space. And later, uh, Baduzzi and Bus, of course, they introduced a more improved uh, version of metadynamics that is very tempered the metadynamics, and now has been even much improved, like we have the on the fly probability sampling, opus and the like. So this is the help to overcome the limitation of standard molecular dynamics and they have been widely used in, in, in drug design. So this is how we do to, 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 to do to overcome these barriers if we are only focused in, 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 in using standard uh, molecular dynamics tool. Because of the limitation in, in the docking calculation, which does not in, include expressed waters, some of those algorithms, they don't do it. And the, some of the algorithms that, that have been used in docking calculations, they don't involve the global flexibility of the protein. So the idea is that is to do a molecular dynamics and from the molecular dynamics, dynamics in relation to trajectory, you do clustering of the ensembles from a very long trajectory and from the samples that they have now a flexibility you extract at the predetermined time step and then you can do some docking calculation of each of the ensemble structure so this process brings increases the sensitivity of a ligand compared to a crystal structure and then you can perform a virtual screening of whatever database based on the cluster uh, samples of the, of the ensemble structures of the snapshot here, 
and then you can take an average. So this will increase the performance and the chance of, and the likelihood of getting a most and probable good heat molecule, and that can be further developed to it. So I will talk later about the machine learning we do. I will focus on this uh, technique. So now I want to share our contribution from our group with the focus of the SARS-CoV-2, as I said before. So the we have like many options, but here I will mention three options that we can target the COVID. Either we can prevent it from entering the human cell, and from entering, we have two options. It's either we limit this transmembrane cell in protease two from activating the AC2 enzyme. And by so doing, we can just target this T person protein. Or we can focus on the S2 receptor interaction, like you see here. So we can block this interaction and the, inhibit this virus from interacting with the AC by using small molecule. So we prevented the molecule from, from uh, interacting with the human cell and the hence it doesn't get in. That is one option. The second option we can do, if the already infection was already taking place, what we can do, we can target to inhibit the polymerization process, or we can target to inhibit the replication process. So there are various um, processes that we can do to, to block the virus or to inhibit the virus, uh, the, the virus by targeting different uh, possibility and different mechanisms within the virus. And I will uh, share with all this really possible and uh, some nice stories that we have. So during the onset of the COVID some years back, our group, we, 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 we collected a library of natural compound that was previously reported by the experimental people from the group of Professor Nyandoro at the University of Dar es Salaam, who's my collaborator. So we collected this library and we said, let's try from something known with antiviral property. And because the idea was to bring an immediate solution to the community. So we said we will do something what we call drug repositioning. So drug repositioning is, 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 is a new trick to all the drugs, bringing uh, uh, all the drug that has been approved for certain indication and uh, you repurpose them for a new indication. So this uh, technique is ideally cheap, is good because it takes a short time. The pharmacokinetic and all those, they are well known because it is in a clinical application. So we, tried, we utilized all this technique I mentioned above. Uh, the, the, the flexibility docking based with the molecular dynamics, uh, enhanced the sampling with metadynamic and the free energy calculation. And we suggested three molecules that has been approved in the some uh, and, and the investigation for other diseases. So we brought a lot of natural compounds that are flavonoid that were similar to compound here, ligand 15. So, because the idea is to bring something very urgently, so we focused on uh, understanding the interaction of this uh, compound, and then we found that uh, some of these flavonoids, they, they show the very good stability by preventing the interaction between the virus and the human uh, cells, the RC2. And it was like that we said, now we need to share this good news. So the good news is that uh, once we published the paper, uh, some other people, they, 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 they reported that uh, computational study, they suggested that asperidine, a flavonoid abundant in citrus species, binding the three main cellular receptors of this. So this information was hard. That, so we can contribute with media and sharing to the community because we reported this flavonoid. And of course, I contacted the, these people from Italy and we had a lot of conversation from what ha happened. And then we 
we were in the process maybe to share the tool to extract this and make some few formulations. So this was a good motivation a way that yes, from computation we can suggest something that can be easier being helped. So they tested the ozone experiment. The molecule of course be, was advanced by other experimental people to some clinical trial and it was really working for inhibiting the interaction, but not viral replication or polymerization, only preventing the interaction of, of the virus. Then we moved on saying that if that was kind of promising, then let us try to invest more time and resources on how we can reduce some false positive binders. So we combined and integrated the metadynamic with an ensemble screening approach <coughs> with the aim of discovering a natural product uh, inhibitors. So we screened the, a, a large library of natural product from the African Natural Product Data Bank that has been curated by Fidere and, uh, and his colleague. And uh, we, 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 we computed, uh, we did a lot of these calculations. And we found that, uh, of course, uh, we cannot trust the docking alone. There is a lot of false positive binders if we just end up. And we don't trust fully the docking result because the docking calculation, for example, for this compound number one, showed the very good promise in, 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 in the docking calculation. Sorry, this uh, at the binding energy, there is a minus sign is being forgotten here. So in kilocalorie, but it's minus sign, sorry for that. But when we came to do an ensemble screening, you can see that the binding are affinity, uh, uh, the KI, the inhibition constant, for number three, which is here, which ranked the a little bit least when we did the docking calculation. Now we is doing much better with the ensemble based screening and is doing much better than compound number one. So, and then when we came to do a metadynamics, because I said the metadynamic, metadynamics is very important in, 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 in enhancing the reaction to go very quickly. So you can see that here the reaction is the time dependent is only the unbinding or the distance between the ligand and some residue is trapped in some minima in the for quite longer time. This is in nanosecond, but for metadynamics within 10 to 20 to 40, it has sampled considerably. So with, with this integration, we recommended this molecule number three, of course, in another grand challenge, the group of Fidere, we recommended it to, 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 to continue working with it in, in the antiviral drug consortium. So then we, we, we continued with the same technique employing uh, the metadynamic with an ensemble based screening with the idea of reducing false positive binders. Here we then increased the, the database from other natural compounds that were not found in our library. So the library is an in-house library. And we screened several other natural compounds from plant. Of course, this plant was highly used during the pandemic by the local people and the local community in the country. And we, we, we observed that one molecule was consistently sensitive during the ensemble calculation. And that is the theory. And was showing a very promise in disrupting the interaction between the, the virus. And then we, we were interested to try understand how water dynamics at the interact, because we know the law of water plays an important law. And we saw that water always was playing an important role to stabilize this interaction by interacting with the rutherin and water remaining for quite a long time and stabilizing this interaction when the rutherin was binding to the residues to the human acid and not much with the, the virus residues. And by doing that, when we performed the a metadynamics simulation, we found that in the absence 
and in the presence of the molecule, there is a considerable change in the distance. So you can see here, after time, it discourages because it binds strongly with the human as cells and the, the cause detachment of the virus here. So this we published then, and it was in 2021. And later, two years, last year, experimental people, they validated what we reported from our, our calculation. So we say simulations met experiment, our simulation met experiment observation, and what they reported in the experiment is exactly what we, 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 we observed. So they say the active binding site we are defined based on the published literatures for we found the routering might interfere with the mixture of residues, which of course we reported them here before. So this has been very encouraging. And then we moved on saying that we needed to bring a, a lot of this molecule as, a, as heat molecule, so we can have a wide range of selection. We then moved to study if neem tree extract could really demonstrate a good potential for inhibiting the virus reentry. So the focus on over here, we, we have been focusing on inhibiting the virus reentry. And later on, I will talk about the, the replication and the polymerization. So to be focused, we still go on with the, with the virus reentry. So we performed the, another metadynamics ensemble with the molecular dynamics, and we found that this compound here, in summer of this, they were showing very good trends. And then we were in contact with some experimental people. I'm not citing their work here. They said that thanks for your paper, we are observing what you are trying to report. The some of these extracts from the neem paper, they are really showing some activity by, by inhibiting the interaction between the two, between the virus and the human cell. And remember, our focus has been also in, in trying to understand that how would really water try to moderate this interaction. Our observation is that water at the interface between the 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 ligand and the interface between the virus plays an important role, and if it interacts with the ligand, stabilizes the ligand, makes it remain there, it enhances the activity of some of some ligand or some heat molecule. There are by making them to be very a uh, potential heat. And then we expanded it, that we needed to find for some molecule that could interrupt the transmembrane cell in protease two and inhibit the virus cell entry. So instead of only focusing on the virus cell entry, because this protein has a role to activate the human as a tool to receive the virus. So if this protein is inhibited, what it does is that then there is it becomes inactive. So some medicine like nafamostat and the, the family of this, they have been designed to inhibit this protein and therefore preventing the virus entry. And the major point for this inhibition, it is at this catalytic reaction center or reaction site. If this is a, a inhibited here, and then the reaction will not take place, and then this the whole system become inactive. So we screened from our in-house database, and we found the molecule one that was interesting that works in 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 a different mechanism uh, compared to nafamostat. So this is what we observed. And here it, it really resulted into thinking of how we can probe and how we can choose some reaction coordinate. So if we compare nafamostat and the, the compound one, so we choose like the position, we call the pose rig, uh, RMSD and the, the ligand of the, 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 the RMS of the ligand. We saw this could be an important reaction coordinate because they measure how much the ligand is really fluctuating at from the initial uh, pause. If there is really higher fluctuation, means that uh, 
and the ligand is really, really fluctuating in the pocket, it could indicate of becoming lower activity or less affinity. And we found that for Nafamo study, at the beginning, changed the position to accommodate a second pose. So this was from the docking pose. Probably the docking pose was much not correct, but the pose too was the most correct because it is spending much time here. Different observation from our compound one, but it exhibited three poses. Number one, number two. And when we looked at the binding orientation, we found yes, they are really different. When we compare this uh, in a famous start in our molecule and compound number one, we found that this is really, really different. So we then went on in trying to understand the interaction behavior by integrating and comparing end point free energy calculation. This they seem to be very important in trying to understand the mechanism of action and how different molecules they could be interacting and bind differently in the pocket. Finally, but not leave the end to uh, last but not the least, we move from heat discovery to lead optimization. So now I will highlight how we moved from a heat molecule we identified. So here I'm just citing one uh, molecule that we will move. So in heat optimization, what we do, you have a queer molecule or a static molecule. So you can do some <coughs> fingerprinting nowadays because of the uh, advances in cheminformatics, et cetera. So we can optimize our molecule and then you can find it a spontent molecule because we say that the similar molecule would do have a similar activity of binding similar. So we did this uh, approach from one of the molecule we reported and we did our optimization process by doing a similarity search in different database, the chamber, the drug bank, and we had salivonorin A. So we said, because we want to find a well potent molecule that can go directly to be tested in clinical trials or in clinical observation. So we suggested this salivonorin A. So we compared the binding of salivonorin A to TML press, this is the protein I was talking before, and also to the AC2 enzyme. So we see some difference in the binding mode that resulted to difference here in the binding affinity. And we found that this compound could, to some extent, inhibit this activity. But we could not manage to test it in experiment. But we were interested in establishing that what could be effective reaction coordinate that could be used to help understand and predict the activity. So here you can see that we have, for example, the endpoint free energy calculation, and we have the posi RMST, RMST and the distance. The two here, they seem to be silence, but at this point from 50 nanosecond, the ligand exhibits several fluctuations similar to the position RMSD. So for us, we say the posi RMSD is, could be an effective reaction coordinate that could somehow probe and give some uh, good prediction for the in, in vitro or in vivo experiment. So we recommended this compound to the experimental people. And also we extracted some compound from the plant and we tested. Surprisingly, we found that if not in a, yes, it has some activity from uh, the, the live SARS-CoV-2 series for both virus theory uh, entry inhibition and the main process activity. But even though it was much potent, but it was really active. So for us, with our approach we used here, we said this is promising and we can first optimize it. And then we tested also for the polymerization process and we said, yes, it was not much potent, but it is active and it is not toxic. So this is a very good contribution from our our group, and I will try to highlight that when we are talking about lead optimization, it's not only about the, the binding affinity. It is always about taking care about issues in aggregation, solubility, 
polymorphism changes, etc. So for here, I will take an example of one of the molecules of interest. Let's talk about luteolin. We reported luteolin before from uh, our group and the experiment of people they also investigated, but it has a challenge of solubility. And we said, let us try to see what happened in the self-assembly process and what is really happened, the interaction, the energies and the solvation. So we found some interesting behavior, the self-assembly process of, of, of returning that there are some really hydrophobic pipe stuck in that they drive and the hydro, hydrogen bonds that they drive the self-aggregation of the rutherin in, in, in the water. So this is a kind of similar study that we did for, for, for necrosamide, which is a similar molecule. So I can just skip it. And finally, my talk will finish on how we can optimize and calculate the solubility. So there are different techniques like machine learning algorithm, molecular dynamics, quantum mechanics, et cetera. In our group, we have been developing machine learning algorithm or techniques, and also we use molecular dynamics simulation to calculate the solubility. So we started with now, Dr. Paul already graduated, he's, uh, he's working in Dar es Salaam, and we worked together in the past with uh, Nasser Yan, now is a PhD student in Oklahoma State University in the US. And now we are working with ANET by developing some machine learning models and algorithm <coughs> to test the solubility of uh, different molecules, the aqueous solubility, just to begin with. And this is uh, really giving us uh, a good intuition that we can contribute a lot. So these are some of the observations that some reaction coordinates are effective in predicting in vitro and in vivo activity. Integration of both machine learning and atomistic simulation is the best for massive chemical space exploration. Now, what is the fate of this? We are scientists, we are working with the community. So I say that a few years I founded a startup company for the fighters. I said, let's choose one of the problem in the community Let's try to apply this technique that we are doing and let's see how is it working. So we focused on one of the problem that is enlarged the prostate and we developed the phytotherapy and that we moved it to clinical trial and it's really doing very, 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 very great. So I will finish by... Daniel, uh, I'm not sure if you meant to talk. Um, we can't hear anything. So it is done. I'm already finished. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you again. Oh, perfect. So uh, this marks uh, the end of uh, the my talk. And I wish to acknowledge um, the group of members, uh, former and current, and uh, my collaborators across the globe and i would wish to say thank you very much for your attention yes thank you very much daniel for a great talk excellent results you have shown and also the great initiative of ipythos that you've shown in the end and i'm sure there will be many questions so the floor is open for questions if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and I will give you an opportunity. Or alternatively, you can also type your question in the chat.
Yes, I see there's a question from Mamaru Al Alem. Please go ahead, Mamaru. It's Mamaru, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello? Yes, we can Is it hear okay you. now? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you, Prof, for giving this chance, and uh, thank you very much, the presenter. It was a very good talk. So uh, I, I would like to ask you some questions. Uh, one of the major problems in drug discovery is, uh, and the reason for iteration of drugs out of market is the toxicity. So I, I didn't see any slide from your talk how you try to manage toxicity issues uh, uh, in, in your research. This is, uh, uh, I, I mean, did, did you use to screen any server or try to run any calculation to screen uh, biocompatible organic molecules or how do you manage toxicity? And, uh, uh, and another question is, in your uh, docking study of uh, the, the COVID virus, the amino acids that show interaction was histidine and lysine. So are, are these the target amino acids in COVID drug discovery? Um, finish? Yeah, my last question is, is uh, somewhere in your slide, I have seen artificial intelligence and machine learning. You start from these things and you end up with uh, quantum chemical and molecular mechanics calculation, including the DFT. Did you try to use DFT in your research and which parameters helped you to uh, decide uh, uh, or screen your compounds from your calculation? Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Mamaru. Um, I'll begin with the first one, with the toxicity. Yes, it is true that uh, most of the drug failure is due to toxicity in the pharmacokinetic issues. Of course, what we do, uh, one of the first criteria to screen is based on the ADME property. So the absorption, distribution, toxicity, and uh, all these things. I did not mention them uh, maybe because of time, but it's something that we do it before we move on. The other reason maybe I didn't mention that we were focusing on something already known is in the bucket and is approved for another indication. So all those the molecules that we, 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 we recommended, they have been uh, approved and they have been used for as indication. So what we did is to repurpose them and to be used for, 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 for the COVID. So that is one of the, of the, of the reasons. But over the recently, we are trying to establish some, some reaction code and, and some calculations that we can predict the toxicity of a molecule. We haven't done it yet, but we are trying to develop and establish such a system that can help to do the, the, the computation and the prediction besides just the line on the machine learning algorithm that has been uh, developed before. Okay. For the second, so the histidine is, uh, is one of the uh, residues where the molecule, uh, let me try to go if I will find it even close here. Some of the less used that they closely interact with uh, so the red one is the virus. The blue here is the human acid. Some of the residues here, so some I'm not showing them, they, are, they show a very strong affinity. So the disruption of this interaction weakens the, 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 the interaction between the virus and the human acid two uh, series or the enzyme. So histidine 31 is one of such residues that is mostly uh, targeted. If the ligand could do disturb and weaken that interaction, that could be a perfect 
because it has, it shows the strongest affinity between it, the virus and the human cell. And the last question was Hello. about uh, yes. Hello. 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 Yes, um, Mamaru, the last question was about, I think I didn't write it. Yeah, uh, did you use DFT calculations? Ah, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. We haven't used the DFT calculation here, but I show that is a tool and technical uh, that can be used, but in my group, we don't use it and we have not used the DFT. Okay. Yes, yes. Hey, excellent. So, Thank you. So, so sorry. So that your screening was based on binding energy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, did you did you realize that this amino acid is where the target amino acid is? Mm -hmm. Regardless of regardless of your league and interaction with these amino acids, are these really the amino acids to target coronavirus? Yes, they are lily. They are lily in a sense that, of course, uh, experimental people they 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 are also observing the same thing that uh, the interaction between the virus and the and the, and the, the human cell is much facilitated by this uh, this less use. Okay. So they, there is a high affinity between this less use when compared to other less use. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that discussion. Let's move on to the next question and I will give Lawrence an opportunity. Hi. So um, sort of dovetailing on the previous question about uh, why some uh, compounds don't make it as drugs is the ability to put it into a, a solid dosage form. This uh, library you have of natural products, have you um, thought about um, doing studies to see like what would be the uh, propensity to crystallize, uh, what would be the polymorphs, what can you co-crystallize it with, to basically see if it could be put in, what can be put into a solid dosage form. Okay, so we, we, we haven't tested them for the polymorphism or crystalline, but it's something we started working on one of the natural compound uh, of 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 interest, so we are trying to study the the crystalline and if it can change it to polymorphism and and the like. So <laughs> that one we haven't explored it much, but yes, we have started it. Right. Um. Let's move on to Paul Mabala. I see you have um asked your question in the chat, but it might be easier just to to um, ask it out loudly. So please go ahead. Paul Mabala. Okay, if his sound is not working, he asked the following question in the chat. So let me read that in the meantime. I'm interested to know where viruses go when prevented from entering a cell during a, the attachment stage of virus replication after being targeted by a drug molecule. Can you read it again, Jack? Okay, I'm interested to know where viruses go when prevented from entering a cell during the attachment stage of viral replication after being targeted by a drug molecule. Ah, okay. So it can be cleared out of the body, maybe by other um, acid. It can be really cleared out if it doesn't go into the human cell. Okay. So, for example, for the SARS CoV 2, that uh, is mostly expresses into the lung or uh, into the fungus. And if it goes to the stomach uh, and there is a lot of acid, then it can go away if it doesn't get into the cells. Okay, if you have any follow-up comment or question on that, Paul Mabala, yeah, please state it in the chat. Okay, let me move on. There are a few more questions in the chat. So 
one small question. Um, haven't you done any QMMM? And secondly, how accurate are your force fields in the MD simulation? So maybe you can first address those two questions. No, we haven't done a QMM. We haven't done it. Okay, and a question about the force field. So how accurate are the force fields you are using in your MD simulation? Okay, so the choice of the force field, of course, it depends with the problem um, that's one it wants to, 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 to address. Uh, this they have been for been been validated with a lot of experimental data and there is a lot of uh, information supporting about the choice of the force field. So the force field we use, they have a lot of background that been supported from even experimental data. And then a follow-up question on that, would the reactive force field be useful or accurate? Thanks. So here it, it really depends with what the problem one wants to address. So there is no like, uh, which is the force field, the, that there is no like a force field for everything. So depending on uh, uh, the, the, the problem you are addressing, if you are working on a polymer with a protein, so there are force fields for specific class of compound that you're interested. For our case, we have been using mostly amber force field and, and, and OPRS because we focus more into small molecule and also the protein and, and, the, and, and sol solvent. Okay, so there's a question in the chat about DFT. Um, yeah, let me read the whole comment. Thank you for this great presentation, Professor. In DFT, solubility is linked to the free energy of Gibbs. How do you calculate this in molecular dynamics? Okay, thanks. If you want to calculate in, in molecular dynamics, maybe you, you would, there's a technique we call QMM, so you combine quantum mechanics and molecular mechanics, but you can honor if with quantum mechanics, you only focus with the region of interest and the rest of the system you treat with molecular mechanics, but mm -hmm. you don't treat entirely like for a drug interaction with quantum mechanics. That is uh, not feasible at, at, at the moment. I don't I don't know know. Know. But for small molecular and solvation, yes, we can do with quantum mechanics. Right, there's a hand from Joey Chifamba. Please go ahead, Joey. Hello, I think you can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. My name is Joey. I'm from the UCLA in Los Angeles. I, I I my my question I think adds on to the question asked by the previous gentleman who actually was asking about whether they've considered um uh, the final dosage forms uh, for the product, because I I I I would do. Uh, okay. Hello. Yes, yes, yes we can yeah. see you. But it might be an issue with the yes, sound. Please. Yeah, please try again. Yeah. Maybe I can try to respond from what he started asking that if we can. So for the last, for the, if if the question is uh, uh, like dialing to the phytotherapy we developed, yes, because we had time to, to, to struggle developing the optimal dosage. So we worked for a long time to come for it. But if the question is on the previews for the SAS COVID, then the answer is no, because we have worked up to in in vitro and we are trying to move. So we have moved for up to a lead optimization from heat discovery to lead optimization. That is the, the thing we have uh, moved up to to the moment. And now we are trying to extend within the same SASCOV to discovery, moving into uh, in, in vivo, uh, testing with, 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 with live cells in, in, in the animal model, but then we will establish all those uh, later on. But for now, for the SARS-CoV-2, 
we have only worked up to in vitro and we have been collaborating with the experimental paper. So what we did is different uh, concentrations of, of, of the compound. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, Lawrence, uh, is that an old hand or do you have another question? That is an old hand, sorry, I will lower it. Okay, no problem. Um, okay, let me give a chance for a last question and then we are going to close this meeting. So anyone who would like to ask a last question? Okay, it doesn't seem so. So I would like to thank again the speaker, Dr. Daniel Shadrach, for an excellent talk. So it is still a hot topic, SARS-CoV-2, and showing um, simulations using state-of-the-art techniques. Um, so thank you very much for this. And I would also encourage um, the participants, if you would like to interact with Dr. Shadrach beyond this meeting, please feel free to do so. Um, contact him in whatever way you can find him, um, preferably an email. And yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Shadrach, for this great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Jad, for organizing, and thanks a lot for everything. So we say goodbye, right? Yes, yes, goodbye. So, uh, goodbye, and everyone, good evening. And good morning for the other people. Good afternoon. <laughs> thanks, Jats, and thanks for uh, for everything. Yes, um, thanks very much again, Daniel, for agreeing. Yeah, it was a great talk. Thanks very much. Thanks. Yes, you're welcome. Um, this is nice. Thanks. <laughs>